Stone came on last time for to kind of talk about the end of season one of Lux and talk about kind of season two coming up. Season two is launched now, uh, and uh, Stone uh, with Lux AI, which we'll talk about in a second here. Uh, there's kind of two tracks you can do. You can do a rules-based bot where you go in and you're doing if statements and doing different algorithms to do searching for movement and stuff. Or you can do reinforcement learning where you drop the environment uh, into this, whichever reinforcement learning algorithm you want to do, and you give the agent some reward function, what it's trying to do. And then it just plays a bunch of games and trains itself to actually do it, which the winning solution from season one of Lux AI was an RL-based solution. And their write-up, speaking of write-ups, is amazing. You should go check it out. Uh, and Stone has a, a notebook for anyone who's interested in RL to get started. Very cool. Yeah. <coughs> so let's pop open uh, Lux season two. Uh, and Stone, I think you'll have to open the stream to be able to see what Nick is sharing here. But uh, okay. Do yes. you want to tell us a little bit about the, the game rules and maybe walk us through the beginning of one replay? Yeah. Um, so, it's, so I guess I'm not sharing the screen, right? Yeah. So I have the screen pulled up so um, folks that are watching on Twitch live can see the, the Lux AI Season 2 competition right now. Um, so yeah, we can start here. And if you just want to let me know, you, you can like drive me <laughs> yeah so let's, let's let's just quickly look at one of the games i guess and we can introduce what the game is like and then how we can start tackling something like that sure. um so maybe go to leaderboard uh, then just play one of the games <clears throat> so yeah, what's also interesting about lux is that we try to support as many languages as possible so you might notice that this first place team is actually a javascript agent the third place team is a Rust kit. Um, they use Rust to program their bot. And then a little bit down, someone in eighth place is using Go. So there's quite a large variety of different languages being used this year. Um, but yeah, we can start looking at this. So this is the game map. This is like our minimal visualizer, which is really useful for doing like basic analysis of your game. And these little big blue red squares are factories. And um, so the theme of this year is Mars and you want to kind of terraform Mars, um, or you can prevent your opponent from terraforming Mars. You want to do that way too. Um, and so these little factories get to build little robots as you see on the screen. The big red square ones are the square ones are heavy robots, um, and the circle ones are light robots, which represent two weight classes. Um, all robots do the same thing. They can dig around, um, mine resources such as ice and ore, um, and they can bring the resources back to the factories by kind of dropping it off and then letting the factory refine them into water and metal. Um, and so water is a crucial resource and it's what is used to kind of win the game. You use water to one, power your factory's little nuclear reactor. If you don't power it, it'll explode. Um, and also you can use water to uh, grow lichen, which is the scoring mechanic here. So whichever team has the most lichen kind of grown at the end of the game uh, wins. And we will see, we'll see that on the map later towards the end of the game. Um, metal is also important because it's what allows you to build more units. And you might see some teams mining metal specifically just so they can build more units, which allows them to mine more water. And you kind of have this endless cycle of mine water, uh, build more units, find, mine metal, build more, more units, and grow lichen, um, and stuff like that. So those kind of like basic things. And on the map, you can see a couple other things. You might notice some like different shading. Um, darker colors means there's high amounts of rubble, which is like very slow to traverse. It costs extra power from your unit to move it across. Um, and lower, lighter tiles are like basically tiles with less rubble, um, and your units can cross cross it, cross it with like no difficulty. Um, some interesting things we're doing this year in terms of game mechanics that are a little bit, a little bit novel um, is there's a lot of planning involved this year. So each little robot has the amount of power they have, and every day turn, um, they generate some amount of passive power. But in order to kind of encourage you to plan more ahead, we actually penalize you whenever you submit an action. So we allow peer players to submit a sequence of actions to plan ahead what the robot should do for the next, let's say, 10 turns or something, or repeatedly do for the next 100 turns. Um, and if you want to update that kind of like sequence, it costs you extra power to do so. So there's an interesting uh, idea around kind of like long-term planning, which is actually quite difficult for RL. Um, and so maybe if you go towards the end of the game, you can start looking at some of the lichen. Oh, I hear a comment here that we've got some echoes going on. Ooh. Oh. 
But I'm listening to stream. I don't hear myself echoing. Stone, can you talk again? Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, is it possible you have like multiple of our windows open? Mm, I don't. So I, yeah, oh, yeah, I, okay. I don't Other folks are saying it sounds good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank, yeah, um, thanks yeah, for so, the feedback, though, uh, chat. Uh, appreciate that. Yeah, so if you start playing through this game, you'll start noticing this lichen kind of grow. And so the, both teams have their own lichen sets. Um, red team has their own lichen, blue team has their own kind of lichen. Um, lichen can only grow on tiles with no rubble on there. So you'll see how like the lichen kind of fills the map. Which I think one is super cool to look at. You kind of see like this lichen naturally growing out, but also introduces some very, very interesting kind of like spatial control kind of strategies where you have to place your factories in very, very strategic locations. You want to be near water, but you also want to be near spaces where you can actually use the water and grow lichen. Um, and so you'll often see that some teams will actually dig channels from one empty space to another just so they can spread the lichen over. But then this also presents opportunity for opponents to kind of dig your lichen out, which then Cost your lichen not to be watered and they all die. Um, so you have to be careful about where you dig your lichen and stuff and just add a lot of strategic complexity and kind of interesting demersion properties that can emerge, um, especially if you use RL. And we'll actually see some of them later. Um, so, and so, so, yeah. To summarize, summarize the rules, uh, at the beginning of the, the game, you're putting down some factories. Those factories can produce light units, which are the little circles, or heavy units, which are the little squares. And those units are trying to go to the blue squares, not the light and blue squares, but the other blue squares, uh, to mine ice ore to bring back to the factory to turn into water. Or the, the dark <clears throat> gray squares, the black squares, which are metal mines, and they bring the metal back to the factory to turn into metal to build more robots. The water then you use to make lichen, the metal you use to make more robots. And robots, instead of like in StarCraft, for example, you can click every frame over and over again until you need to do something. Uh, in Lux, we have a penalty for whenever you give a unit another action that they take a little bit of extra power. Um, so you should, instead of just saying, go to the next square, go to the next square, go to the next square, you would say, go north 10 squares, go east four squares, mine four times, then go west four squares and south four squares, and then drop off your, your load. Um, and that makes it pretty interesting because then the enemy might you know, move into your way. Uh, there's collisions, so if two robots move onto the same square, um, one or both of them get destroyed. Uh, and at the end, whoever is growing the most lichen wins. Very cool. Now I want to see a collision um, of some kind. But <laughs> Yeah, if you look at early game uh, in the top ones, so a lot of people will put their factories close to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check it out. Um, yeah, you, so you need is I think red team here is trying to build lots of small units and I think they're trying to destroy the other ones. So you can see like towards the middle map, the blue and red units are kind of like dancing around each other, trying not to get destroyed. <laughs> yeah, if if you want to see like a, a interesting, do you see, have that replay that I sent you yesterday or something or so, where the it's uh, very aggressive check, strategy. So exit, go back to the leaderboard. There's a team called. L something, L M A something. L M A uh, something. What do we got here? Oh, L Maldas. Right. Yeah, I think they're the one that's super aggressive. Okay. So they so spawn they their factories, yeah, right next to the opponent, and then they try and squish their robot right off the bat. So I could choose any of the the replays here, any of these games, and. Yeah, pick one that they didn't err on. Maybe one they won, so you could see like. Oh, okay. How, how do I go? Let's, oops. Um, let's see, a win. Okay, so the, yeah, their latest game is a win. We'll check this out. Um, should I zoom to a particular uh, part of the... Uh, the early game is definitely what you'll want to watch. Okay. So you'll see oh, another thing, I think our pictures cover the bottom of the map. I'm not sure. If... Yeah, well, most of the factors are on the top, so we're good here. Okay. Okay, all the factors are out. Uh, are they red or blue here? They're red, so... Or no, they're blue, sorry. So you'll see they're... They abandon their factories. <laughs> they all die. And then you can see they just moved over to the enemy base. And they're like, come here. I'm going to run you over. <laughs> and you can see that as soon as someone pops out, they're moving on to try and squish them. Yeah. There they go. Oh, they almost got the one on the top there. <laughs> 
And the heavy. So another thing. thing to... Or go oh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say another thing to point out is just defender's advantage. So when we do collision handling, when two movie units like kind of collide each other, the unit with more power survives. So it's actually quite difficult for attackers to attack you unless they're very, very well programmed. There you go. Got another one. It's squishing a lot of the small, small robots that are coming out of the base. But we don't have any like animations to really call it on the map, so it's kind of hard to. We can just see. just we add like sound a, effects, yeah. A, uh, a pow. Yeah. Or a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, yeah, this is this is very cool. Um, giving me both StarCraft yeah. and I mean I don't know if you guys are watching Last of Us vibes. I don't know the Lycan. <laughs> so. Yes, that yeah. show was very very heart wrenching. Episode three. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just watched it a couple days ago. I um, also want to shout out one of our community members. So this visualizer was actually not written by me or Bovard. It was actually written by someone who, who's a competitor. competitor. Um, I think he got tired of my code, which is really poorly written. I am not a front end dev anymore. Um, so he made this version, which is much better. Oh, that's um, shout so Shout out to our community for building these tools. So. That's great. That's great. Was that part of, because I know you did sort of like a preview or a beta launch of Lux AI. Was that some of yes. the feedback that the came beta visualizer. Yeah, the beta visual was one I wrote, and then he wrote this one also for the core competition as well. Um, and then you kind of repurpose it for Lux, and it works really well. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, just missing the explosions and the sound effects, but um, Lux AI Season 3. <laughs> cool. Um, where should we head to next? Yeah, I think that's mostly about the competition. Obviously, you can check out the prizes tab, because... That's pretty exciting this year too. Uh, season one had I think fifteen thousand in prizes, but this year we've got fifty-five k, uh, and we've got a nice. special prize from one of our sponsors um, that you can read about there. But first place is fifteen k this year, which is awesome. Uh, and our sponsors tab, I think we have one of the sponsors here in chat, but uh, we've got a few sponsors this year too. Uh, if you click down on the yeah. Sponsor there you go. Sponsorship. Yeah, I'll just give a quick shout out. So Quanco, um, they sponsored us last year as well. Um, big growing tech company. They're hiring, so email them if you're interested. Uh, the one, the, the person that's in our chat, I think, is from Regression Games. So they're a new uh, startup. Uh, super exciting stuff they're doing over there. Uh, very much in line, kind of with like some of our work and some um, other things. Oh, uh, they tried to post a link, but I don't think it worked. Um. Yeah, you can see the link. It's probably play.regression.gg, I imagine. Yeah, if that's the link, we, uh, we would have posted there. So yeah, I um, invite yeah. you all to play test it. If you like Lux, you'll definitely like their kind of platform. You're basically trying to play games, like a sport, <laughs> with AI. Um, so super exciting. Um, encourage you guys to join. Um, and our last sponsor, TSBC, they're a uh, venture capital, um, and they're actually quite interested in like looking to like net the new kind of AI-based startups. So if you have AI-based ideas, uh, feel free to contact them. Um, yeah, I think that's just it for sponsors. Uh, and then we can awesome. get on with the notebook next tab. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So, Stone, you have two notebooks here. Do you want to kind of tell us what the differences are between the yeah. two? Yeah. So, reinforcement learning actually is like normally like a college level course that spans like an entire quarter, but we want to condense <laughs> this down to two notebooks, <laughs> especially for a very hard game like Lux. Um, so, I best I can put it to two notebooks. Um, so yeah, we have a one as an intro to RL core uh, kind of notebook. It covers kind of the bare bones of RL. Um, and then the second notebook will then start trying to tackle the Lux AI challenge. Um, and so yeah, yes. uh, just a quick intro to RL that I put a funny video there. Um, but the general, <laughs> or I guess I can quickly introduce it. So RL is basically a learning framework where you have some kind of like embodied agent in a world, right? It's, it's either a single agent, multi-agent, and it's constantly interacting with the world, like doing actions, like me, right, myself, That's I move relatable. my hands, looking around. <laughs> yeah, and then as you work around, you get rewards. Um, so like, if you're learning to like, like let's, let's say you're training a dog, right? You feed your dog a tree if they're doing something what you want, and that's called reinforcement, right? That's positive reinforcement, but it's also punishment too. Um, and they're both valid ways of training an agent these days. Um, and yeah, the chicken video is just a very obvious example of it happening. Um, so in that video, um, I think they're feeding a chicken yep. um, to kind of poke a dot. And so every time the chicken pokes the correct dot, they kind of feed it more. 
<laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Okay. And start like, noticing they make it harder for him. Yeah. Um, They're like faking, picking up the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm not falling for your shenanigans. I want whatever <laughs> that is. <laughs> yeah. So you can see the food as the reinforcement, or also known as kind of the learning reward. Um, the reward is you get food. Um, for agents, that's, that's just a number. Um, and in machine learning, the way that works is that we kind of want to optimize our policy, our agent, um, to maximize the sum of rewards over time. Um, and that's also known as return. So like the reward at time step one plus all the rewards until time step like N uh, is equal to your return. And so you can quite, kind of look at this diagram for what's called the environment loop, which is pretty important to understand. Um, the environment loop is basically saying, okay, uh, we have an agent in an environment, the agent takes an action AT at time step T into the environment and the environment returns us two things, the next observation or state, so ST plus one and the next reward um, telling us how well we're doing basically. Uh, and this kind of environment loop is the core of every single RL algorithm almost. Um, they all rely on this interaction to kind of figure out, okay, where should I be, what should I be doing? Where should I explore um, and how to solve a problem? Um, and do yeah, you have the example environment that you're gonna be using in this notebook? Yeah, so in this notebook, there's an example. Um, there's a, this is what's called classical control tasks. Um, they usually are very simple, but classical problems in robotics and control. Um, this one is called cart pull, and the objective cart pull is actually just to move your cart left and right until your pole stays up without falling over. Um, mm. So I don't know if the videos will play. I, I, should they play in the notebook? I hope they play. Yep. So that black thing in that graph is a cart, and then yep. you got your pole, and Go the pole's got to fall over. Right? Yeah, so you scooch over to try and keep that up. So you see, this. So what's happening right here is we're using a random policy. A random policy here is just basically sampling from the action space. So something important to understand is that for all these R algorithms, they expect like a constant action space and observation space. And this kind of space, mathematically speaking, is like <clears throat> a definition of what you can do. So the action space for the carpool environment is like plus one or minus one. Plus one means go to the right, minus one means push the cart to the left. Um, and obviously to solve the game, you need some combination of left and right based on where the pole is right now to make sure it stays upright. Um, and then the observation space is basically the definition of what the agent sees, the policy sees. Um, in the case of car pole, I think all it sees is the position of the car and also the angle of the pole, uh, which is sufficient to solve the problem. <coughs> so yeah, so you see when you're running a random policy, it's just randomly moving left and right and doesn't do very well, can't survive for very long. So now we can try using reinforcement learning. So um, in RL, um, I don't think this notebook will cover the exact algorithm, but it kind of covers describe the general anatomy of an algorithm. Um, so we use something called stable baseline, which is a really popular, like very user-friendly kind of R library. There's a ton of other ones like RL live, uh, uh, Show. there's a bunch of other different R libraries out there. Um, and standard stable baseline generally makes things pretty easy to learn from. Um, so from here in this example code, we're showing basically we're gonna create an environment with Jin.make. Um, we're gonna create an algorithm um, and then we're gonna learn for about 10,000 interactions. So after we kind of do that environment loop 10,000 times, uh, we're mm -hmm. gonna stop learning and then we're gonna try evaluating. And so with stable baselines, they print you like kind of an output here. So it tells you the reward over time. So ep underscore re ep underscore mean is basically the average return you have every episode. And how long and does it train... take to run 10,000? So for stuff. carpool, this takes like, less than 10 seconds, I think, 10 to 20 seconds. Okay. It's a very easy environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for Lux, it's a different story. Um, but yeah, you'll see how the reward kind of goes up over time. Um, yeah, and it works pretty yeah. well. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of other metrics in there you don't need to worry about too much. Um, and so once it's trained, you can kind of watch a video here. You'll see that it does a much better job forking it. I could, uh, I could do at least that now. good with a broom handle on my neck. <laughs> 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 well, there's a lot of research into figuring out why humans go, go, go. Like <laughs> yeah. Does it lose when it goes out the side of the screen too? I think it loses when the car pole is too far angled off or something. I don't okay. know if it goes off the screen or something. But yeah, this policy is actually not perfect. If you train longer, it would be much better. Yeah, it doesn't um, quite get ahead of it. It's just like, no, we must go this way because it's leaning this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, through the environment loop, um, it's repeatedly figuring out which one's a good action, which one's a bad action, um, and it learns from that. Um, a little bit more complicated, um, because rewards are kind of delayed sometimes, because when you take an action, you don't know 
directly if that's the right action or not. The reward function for this environment is actually a time reward function. Basically, for every time mm -hmm. step you're still alive, you give you plus one. Mm -hmm. So it's not very informative, right? If I move left a little bit, I'm still alive. It doesn't actually mean that's the best action to take. Um, yeah. And so in reinforcement learning, we have what's called a discount factor, where basically the reward from, let's say, 20 steps ago is discounted by gamma to the power of 20. Um, mm -hmm. So like it could be like 0 0.99. 0 0.99 to the power of 20 times the reward 20 steps ago is how much that reward contributes to the current return value. Um, and so we're basically saying like, okay, we care about mostly about the immediate reward, but you also care about rewards in the past. Mm -hmm. And then we combine this in a learning algorithm that accounts for actions that you took in the past to figure out, okay, from taking this action 20 steps in time in the past, it led to this much return in the next 20 steps. Um, and this is a much more accurate way of measuring things and it's more, um, less variance in some way, um, because now we're not looking at a single time step reward. We're looking at the next 20. Um, this is a better estimate of what we're doing if it's doing well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any questions about the RL stuff? Yeah, and then for like a game like tic-tac-toe, for example, a very simple game, your reward uh, ultimately can be whether you win the game or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess we'll talk about this when we get, but and then we have sparse rewards and stuff. So we'll talk about the next notebook. But so there's yeah, a bunch of different rewards. Sparse rewards is also a very active. Like not, not like research topic to some extent because pl learning from sparse rewards is incredibly difficult because like if you don't get a reward until the end of an episode which could be after like a hundred steps it's very very hard to figure out which actions actually helped you so you could do like wander around for 50 steps doing nothing and then for the last 50 steps do something re relative uh, or related uh, so learning from sparse rewards is often a very active research topic and it is also something quite interesting and i'll talk about more in the luck tutorial of why sparse rewards are also important but yeah, so I think the other important thing, thing to talk about is in reinforcement learning, it's incredibly sample efficient. And what that means is that you need many samples, many environment interactions just to learn something. And this is like completely different to a human. A human can mm -hmm. like balance this with ease, right? And it's because we've learned these motor actions from a very young age. All our pre-existing knowledge allows us to adapt to new problems. We know what gravity is. Space. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like if we ask us to open like a cabinet drawer, right? It's super easy, right? Even if the handle looks a little bit different, we can open it with ease. With AI and machine learning, they don't have that kind of reward knowledge and it's quite difficult to learn. Um, and so we kind of rely on just extra sampling, right? More data. Um, so one way to scale up deep RL, which is very, very important for kind of training really large scale RL algorithms with lots of data is to vectorize your environment. So right now, earlier we showed you one environment and that one environment returns you an observation. Let's say this observation has 10 dimensions in it or three dimensions. By vectorizing the environment, we basically add what's called a batch dimension. Batching an environment basically lets us say we can submit 10 actions for 10 environments, and those 10 environments will return us each their own observation. Mm. So we submit 10 actions, get a batch of observations of shape 10, comma 3 or something. And this allows us to leverage the power of parallelization, which is a very, very much, a much a very, very easy to scale kind of approach of computation. VS uh, a faster single thread compu uh, kind of compute. Um, so we know these days, um, a lot of people like to try one, we run neural networks on GPUs slash CPUs. Mm -hmm. um, and the importance of that is because neural nets are just a bunch of matrix operations usually, and that's much faster when you can parallelize those computations. Um, something more advanced, these days people are also writing environments on the GPU and TPU. Um, and in fact, Lux season two actually provides a GPU slash CPU powered environment using JAX. Um, and by powering, yeah. our, and our by powering, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, and by powering an environment with JAX or some kind of GPU TPU programming, you can vectorize the environment on the GPU, which is much much more scalable. Like for example, on JAX, the Lux Season Two environment, you can run like four thousand copies of it at once mm -hmm. with no with no problem. Whoa. Um, and the memory compute, the memory cost of that is quite minimal uh, to run four thousand of them. Are we seeing people um, in the in the Kaggle competitions using? Are, are we seeing people do that? Uh, I think people are beginning to use it. We have mm -hmm. tutorials on it. I'm actually going to release another notebook on it soon, just so like a basic tutorial, but some of our more advanced competitors are using it to learn things. Very cool. Uh, and actually, one of the teams on the lead board is an RL agent. Um, I don't think I can name who, but they're in the top five right now. Um, but they are also using that JAX environment to power their stuff. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, factorizing your environments is pretty important. And you'll notice that in that tutorial notebook, if you increase the number of environments, so like NMs, um, if you increase that, it'll run faster. Um, mm. Obviously, don't increase that past the number of cores you have. So on Kaggle notebooks, I think the default is four CPU cores. If you go beyond that, you'll just get slower. Yep. Um, so yeah, running four parallel environments, pretty fast. Um, you can almost double the speed of training. Uh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. And if anyone's, anyone in the chat has questions, feel free to drop them in. Uh, but I think that uh, makes sense. Yeah, so if somebody wanted to say, get a little bit more of a intuition or feel for uh, this notebook, the intro to RL, if they were to log in or create an account, I'm not logged in here, but you could they could copy and edit this notebook. And then what kinds of things would you recommend somebody, like what parameters would you recommend somebody Play around with just to experiment and see and develop a little bit yeah. more intuition i guess um, you say so here like try a number of envi oh. environments parameter for the um the scaled version but yeah so some fun things to try out is trying different environments there's a whole list of environments you can just search up gem environments and there's a whole list of like pre-installed ones usually oh, cool. so carpool there's one that's called lunar lander where you try and land a lunar ship i don't know what to call it uh it's a lunar lander yeah, <laughs> yeah oh yeah okay, so <laughs> spaceship lander. yeah I guess. um there's also there's also a race car one and you can also try to learn things from pixels um so given an ob uh, image observation try to use that to generate an action um so there's a lot of things like that um and for those who think they're a bit more advanced so unfortunately these algorithms are quite opaque um there is a very good resource called spinning up this is actually how i learned some of my rl stuff um, so I'll send the link. I don't think I can send it. Yeah, I'll you send it to me link. and I'll send it to So spinning up by OpenAI is a very, very good resource for learning the basics of RL, um, RL algorithms specifically. Um, and so with those algorithms, the one that we use in particular is called uh, PPO, Proximal Policy Optimization. This has been the standard of this field, along with SAC, it's another algorithm. These two have been like the standard of the field since like 2016. Um, for some reason, no one has come up with a really substantially better algorithm. And the main reason why is because PPO is one really well taught for some mm -hmm. reason. It's very well easy to understand. And understandable algorithms are generally more important than more powerful ones, um, especially for beginners. So a lot of people use it. The second thing is PPO is surprisingly more robust than other algorithms. The number of hyperparameters, even though there's like 10 of them for this one, is much less than other algorithms. Um, and so it makes PPO quite flexible as a tool. You don't need to do too big of a hyperparameter search to kind of do, uh, kind of figure out how good your algorithm is. And hyperparameter searching is quite difficult with P, uh, RL because RL to figure out how good your hyperparameters are takes a lot of training to figure out. Uh, it's not the same as supervised learning where we have a much better understanding of okay, how does um, can we compare the loss initially, right? Because what happens with RL is that let's say your agent doesn't do very well initially it could easily by accident be super well at the end for some reason. Um, there's a lot of black boxing of RL that's very hard to understand at the moment. Even the top researchers can't give you good estimates of like, for this particular environment, will the algorithm work or mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. um, you kind of have to tune them. Um, but some interesting things that you could tune is like something I mentioned earlier is the gamma or discount factor. Um, you can kind of play around that discount factor, like range it from 0 0.8 to like 0 0.9 and see how that kind of affects your learning. You'll notice that, for example, if you set the gamma factor to be too large, that's sort of encouraging your agent to learn from rewards from the very beginning of time. Right. If you set it too short, it's only going to learn very short-term rewards, uh, which might not be helpful. So you might notice that if the gamma is like 0 0.5, you're only ever going to weigh like the last three time steps. And you see that with the carpool environment, it doesn't learn very well as a result. Um, but if you set it to like 0 0.99, it'll work fine. Uh, and you'll know the same thing for Lux. Uh, for Lux, if you set it too low, it won't work. Uh, if you set it too high, it won't work either. Uh, so you kind of have to find like the go with Lux spot. Um, yeah, so that resource is really good for learning things. Uh, I personally would recommend PPO. And last season, the people who won the competition and some of the best kind of solutions were all using PPO. Um, it just works. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's. I think that's a, a great kind of example of how just playing around and like experimenting with things can help people develop a more of an intuition about how this all works. Um, should we uh, jump over to the second notebook? This is the yeah. kind of like solving this for the case of Lux AI, Lux AI 2, so the actual um, kind of problem. Yeah. So I've got the, uh, the notebook so pulled up here. Okay. 
Christ. Um, where are we? Okay, yeah. So, um, for Lux Season 2, there's quite a lot of extra work that needs to be done to kind of get RL to work. Um, and the main reason why is because Lux Season 2 is designed to be, like, well, easy to understand, but has a lot of layered complexity and interaction with game mechanics that makes applying stable baselines or any RL library actually out of the box not super easy. Um, so, for those who want to understand this really well, I highly recommend you to kind of, like, read the specs first. So, those mm. are on our website, luxai.org, slash specs, ss2. Once you understand the general game rules, the rest of this kind of tutorial will make more sense. And I think we already introduced some of it earlier, so I'll just probably go through with it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and we have like a little nice site you can read all the rules on. Um, yeah, so the main thing to understand first is uh, with reinforcement learning, again, I remember I earlier mentioned that all these libraries expect a constant action space and a constant observation space. Um, and so with Lux AI, we actually have three phases of the game. Mm -hmm. We have first a bidding phase, which is where you bid to go first in the game. Um, and the team that goes first gets to place their factory first. And there's some interesting game theoretical mechanics in there. The second phase of the game is actually placing the factories. And then the third phase of the game is the normal phase of the game, which is where you, what we saw from the majority of the game of people moving robots around, spawning robots, mining stuff, etc. And so these three phases have different action spaces. And so we kind of need to combine them together or find one way to abstract two of them out. Um, in this particular tutorial, we'll show you how to upgrade what's called the reset function to kind of remove two phases from the game and skip directly to the normal phase. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other thing we need to look at is also just how do we make AI or machine learning work? Uh, oftentimes in machine learning, the biggest thing you need to do first is to simplify the problem. And this is why I call this tutorial notebook kind of like our problem solving, which I think is very often not covered enough, like just like mm. the different tricks and things you can do to make a problem work easier to solve. Um, so if you're like a data scientist or anyone in machine learning, you always know that um, feature engineering is incredibly important. Um, and that's exactly what we do here with observations and actions. We want to kind of, one, use our own understanding of the game and as well as maybe some our other analysis tools to figure out, okay, what observations on the observation space are actually necessary and we can keep them. And the ones that we don't need, we remove them so we can train faster. Um, and so that's part of some point the observation space. The code is a little bit long since there's a lot of things you want to include. But in this particular RL environment, we're just including an observation of a heavy robot and your factory, um, in addition to the closest ice tile. And we can explain some of the reasons why later. Um, and so the same thing goes with action space. Um, within reinforcement learning, the smaller the action space, the easier to learn from. But you also have to balance the fact that with a smaller action space, with things removed, it means your agent has less options to explore from. Right. So for example, you could uh, remove self-destructing from the action space. And that, but then that just means that you're assuming that self-destructs are not useful. And that's actually probably wrong. Actually, some teams already use self-destructs and it's a really easy way to add rubble on a tile. Oh, interesting. Um, so you want to be careful of that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, simplifying the action space and observation space is incredibly important. The other thing to be wary about is that Lux is actually a multi-agent RL environment. So multi-agent adds a lot of complexities. Um, and I think for just for, just for this tutorial, we treat Lux as a single agent environment. Okay. Um, and we'll show an example how to do it later. The reason why is just because this works directly with any RL library as a result, because most of them are designed for single agent. Um, if you want to do multi-agent, there's a couple extra things you can do to do that easily. And the really simple way of doing multi-agent is treating both teams as your own team. So what happened mm -hmm. is that you would generate the observation for both teams and you treat that as two separate environments, basically. Um, and so it's sort of like how we scaled up RL earlier by increasing the number of environments. In this case, we're scaling up by basically saying you play every single team. And that's what's called self-play, actually. Um, and so learning from self-play is a very, very common strategy for multi-agent learning, especially from scratch. And you might have seen uh, companies like DeepMind do that with uh, Chess um, and AlphaGo. They play both of those from scratch, uh, or their newer models did. I think the original ones used human data. Um, and playing from scratch actually has a lot of interesting results, like uh, emergence. If you play from scratch with very few reward functions to find, you let your agent decide what's optimal. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So there's quite a lot of extra code there that's mostly just to handle kind of the semantics of Lux Season 2, but once that's all written, the RL code is actually quite easy. Um, so yeah, sections 1, 2, and 3 cover basically how to simplify that. We first simplify the observation space by creating what's called an observation wrapper. All it does is just convert an observation to things that we want. 
Um, the action space, we convert it using what's called a controller. Um, and this controller will basically convert uh, one action to the Lux action. Um, the Lux action being the, the original action supposed to submit to the original action space environment. And a third one is transforming into a single phase. The most simplest solution to do this is you can write a heuristic policy for bidding and factory placement. And every time you reset the environment to start learning again, you just reset to you use those policies to help you reset. So you're going to reset, uh, solve the bidding phase, solve the uh, factory placement phase, and now you're starting from the normal game phase. And so the learning RL agent is always going to be planning in the normal phase, and for other parts of it, it doesn't do anything with it. Now, those are also very open problems. Like you could uh, train your own RL agent just to solve factory placement alone. Um, you can also do something more end to end based on how well your factory placement is, your RL learning agent for a normal phase might do something different. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that people can explore here. Um, and bidding is also another thing that could be explored. I don't think actually RL should be used to solve bidding necessarily, but it could be used. Um, and yeah, so. And bidding, um, I don't <clears throat> know if we quite cover that, but. You, you start with a certain number of resources that you can add to your factories as you place them. But to figure out who goes first in the map, since it's an asymmetric map, uh, you have you can spend some of those resources to say, I would like to go first, or I would like to go second. Mm -hmm. And then whoever has the highest bid, you subtract their resources from the their starting pool of resources, and they get to place first. So maybe there's like some really good spot that you think is completely game breaking. Um, if we didn't have bidding, it's like, the flip of the coin, whoever goes first just wins. With bidding, you could say, oh, I'm going to bid you know, a lot of resources to go first there. So. The cool mechanic. And another, another thing, going first is not always out of the cages. So for example, we saw one team do a super aggressive strategy. For them, going second is always an optimal choice because they want to mm, place yeah. a practice right next to the opponent. <laughs> um, but for some teams, they want to like maybe take a good spot earlier or something. Right. So and I guess spots, so. you can see the bid, right? For both teams. Yeah, you can also see what they bid. And yeah. when you're placing your factories, so if you see that that person bid to go second, maybe you change your your factory placement slightly because they might right. be a rush team or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the last thing about RL problem solving, and this is the biggest solution that everyone does, is custom rewards. Um, and so previously we showed that in the carpool environment, the reward function was like a survival reward function. Basically, we give you plus one for each time step you're surviving. For Lux, this is not super easy to do because there's a quite a few steps to do for surviving and mm -hmm. you need to do a lot of extra steps. Uh, for example, in RL and Lux, for example, you start with an initial amount of water in each factory. It will survive for that amount of time. Um, and so if you get a plus 150 reward, it doesn't mean that you did anything right. It just means you didn't destroy your factory initially. So maybe you learned something. But you need to, uh, so the way we do this, we want to do what's called stage rewards or dense rewards. Dense rewards refers to a reward function design where we give you much more information in the reward than just plus one or plus one for yeah. winning. So, um, and to, so to jump in here for a second. So like Lux is a really long game and it's not immediately clear like who's winning. So you could just say, oh, play RL. And at the end, if you won, you get a one. And if you lost, you get a zero. And like Lux, or like someone was saying earlier, it's like very difficult to figure out what actions contributed toward you mm -hmm. winning. So to get around that huge, sparse, giant action space, we're, we're doing intermediate steps, essentially. It's like, you get a little bit of reward for this, a little bit of reward for that. Yeah. Makes sense. <clears throat> and so for Lux, is a very simple one you can do is you want to, let's say, reward your agent for digging ice, and then reward your agent for kind of like dropping ice on a factory and converting to water. Um, and so with the Lux environment, the CPU engine at least, we provide you a lot of useful statistics. So if you go down the custom environment wrapper, um, you'll see that there's a reward function design there. So we record you a bunch of like kind of custom statistics, um, like total amount of ice produced, total amount of water produced. And if you look at the, the difference in water, this step compared to previous step, that tells you how much you produced that turn. And so every turn you're generating water, we give you that amount of end reward. Meg just said control you're... F finds total ice. Is that what we want to look for? Yeah. Yeah, search, uh, or just search reward equals or something. <clears throat> Here we go. <clears throat> yeah. Nice. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Ice so here we record a bunch of metrics. Divide 100 yeah. plus water produces, but. 
Um, and so the reason why we also divide by hundreds is because we want to kind of shape every word a little bit. And this is kind of like an art at this point. There's actually quite a lot of research that looks into how to analyze your word shaping design, um, but those are quite advanced. So I'll just talk about some general heuristics. So a general heuristic for designing a reward function is one, you want your ultimate goal to be there. So for example, for us, our ultimate goal is to produce as much water as possible. We could replace this with like a written kind of reward where we give you more reward for more lichen, but this is just a simple tutorial. That's something you can explore yourself. Um, and so in this one, we want to reward you most for producing water because that's our end goal. But we know that in the process of getting water, you have to dig ice. And so we have to give you some intermediary rewards. Without these intermediary mm -hmm. rewards, you kind of have to rely on luck to kind of generate water. Like you have to rely on the fact that over the course of maybe a hundred actions by accident, your agent somehow gets to an ice tile, digs it by accident, and has enough power to then transfer it back to the factory by accident. Uh, and the reason why I say by accident, because when you start an RL agent from scratch, it's initialized to what's called like a, uh, it's initialized with a Gaussian distribution. It, whenever it takes a random action to explore, it's completely random. It will do anything. <laughs> um, and so the chances of you getting water produced is very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of had to add these intermediate rewards because the probability of you getting ice dug out is actually much higher um, than yeah. producing water. So if you and wanted so to like will... train a, an agent, instead of doing water, let's say you're trying to train that rush bot that we looked at earlier. So maybe yep. your, your rewards might be like, how far away are your bots from the enemy factories, and then how many enemies did you squish, basically, yep. or destroy, or something like that? And then you would get a much more aggressive bot that kind of hugs their factories and tries to to, to jump on the to destroy their units. Yeah, um, I want to show an example of the training logs because I can't get TensorBoard working on the notebook, but I can send a picture of what it looks like, and you can kind of see the progress of the agent over time. Um, so let me we get a picture somewhere. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're okay. Logs. Okay. So yeah. Um, so we have these intermediate rewards. There's obviously a lot of things you can do. For example, you can add a reward function to encourage your agent to go close to an ice tile, um, which there is. Go, oh, sorry. What? I just sent Meg the the picture. Oh yeah. Oh. It's in the chat. Oh, is that the diagram I showed you? Yeah. Is that what? Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess you can look at that. Uh, I was gonna get a picture of the the reward over time, basically how oh, the okay. agent trained over time. But we can also go through the diagram as well, but let me quickly get this one. Mean length. I stug. I don't know if I will be able to open this in this browser. Nope. <laughs> yeah, so Oh, okay. Do you have a public link to the image that I'd be able to open? Uh, oh, right. I can't show our, our chat on, uh, on stream. Yeah, like if you just right click and, and download, and then you can open it in Chrome. Oh, I could, yeah, I could download it. Yeah, okay. Uh... Sorry, so many steps just to open up an image. Open with, I just, let's see if it, yes, here we go. Uh -huh. Yay. Zoom yeah. in here. So this is a Oops. quick diagram made for people to help understand like the anatomy of an RL algorithm for a complex environment. So usually what happens is you have your original environment, but you gotta do a lot of things to make it easier to learn. So one, we have, our environment, which gives us an observation, which I call the Lux observation. This is the original observation. Um, and then this actually observation contains observation for both teams, actually. So we have to get a custom observation wrapper that converts the observation to something that we want. We call it observation. In addition, um, based on the Lux observation, we generate our own reward function. Um, so both our own reward function, our own observation feeds into our robot, we learn on it, and then we generate an action. And then in that action, it kind of goes through like a joystick, right? If you're playing a game with like a joystick, it kind of simplifies the raw action inputs you're actually sending to the game. Um, so the action gets sent through a controller, that controller converts it to an actual action that can be used by the environment. And then this is where self-play or optionally comes in. So for the tutorial, we do single agent in the sense that the other team is actually an empty agent, it doesn't do anything. But for more advanced solutions, you can replace the other team's action with your own actions as well, or your own heuristics. So you can play and learn against a teacher agent. Like for example, um, if you copied one of the agents from online, downloaded it and placed it as an other team that generates the actions, 
you will learn to play against that team and learn to beat it over time. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also the question of, okay, you're overfitting to that one team, right? right? You can't overfit to that one team. So just figuring out what the other team's action should be is an open problem. Most time people would just do self-play. And so we generate one dictionary of actions and put it back in the environment and the loop goes round and round. <laughs> it works like that. Such as it is with life. Uh, so many different parallels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, reinforcement yeah. and rewards in uh, real life. So great. Uh, and then Bovard, I just sent you another picture. So those are like the training logs. So you can kind of see how the agent behavior changes over time a little bit. Uh, yeah. Cool. Bovard just uploaded it as a Kaggle data set, and then I'll use our API to download it. And then <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually going to Kaggle when you said that. I was like, oh, there's something on Kaggle. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> uh, just trying to make this uh, even more complicated. Okay, um, give me one moment to open this up. Um, cool, here we are. So this is the TensorBoard screenshot. Yeah, so this is an example training. Um, so there's a couple things to look here. So we have training and then we have rollout and we have eval. So rollout is actually the training kind of interaction. So every time we interact with an environment, we get rewards. And this is the average reward during training. And you see how this reward kind of goes up over time, which means we're doing well. In this case, it means that we're generating more water and we're digging more ice. Um, yeah, so on the other side, we have training. Oh. First graph, let's talk about what each of the graphs are. But it looks like, so the first graph is the episode length. So for those who are familiar with the game, if you don't dig any ice and get it back to your factory, your factory dies, it explodes. So you would expect a very small episode length, which is at zero there, it's very small. By the time it gets to 2 million, still small, but from 2 million to 4 million, it somehow is like figured out, oh, wow, I could like get some ice and bring it back to my factory. And then by the time you're up at 10 million, it's consistently making it to the end of our max number of turns, right? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah. And so we also have training metrics here, which is like the things we showed earlier in a reward function. These two things are actually directly what contribute to a reward function. And so it's hard to see on this picture, but you'll actually notice that when you're training, the ice dug increases first, and then water produced mm. starts increasing with it. Cool. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, interestingly, you'll notice that the amount of ice dug is about four times the amount of water produced. And this is because of our game rule, where the amount of ice dug the ratio of ice to water produced is four to one. And so naturally you'll see that the agent actually gets efficient and make sure every single amount of ice it digs, it converts to water. Um, yeah. Um, nice. And then again, we show the rollout one and it's just reward over time. If it's increasing, that means your agent's doing well. <laughs> yeah. Really nice. And so um, folks who might like fork this notebook or use a version of this notebook that will be able to uh, see these these training metrics yep. very cool um so i think that's that and then the last part of it is just submission information which people can just read themselves i think um and if you want to watch an example of the agent plane we could watch it um let's do, do it do that? Do, yeah do any more questions about the rl stuff where do we where do we find uh, the agent uh where can we watch watch them play so um good. yeah you can just watch my own team uh, my team is currently the RL agent. I was going to make a new account just to make an RL baseline account, but I forgot to do that. <laughs> so, so yeah, go to so. the leaderboard on the season two competition and look for Sun Tao. I think he's in bronze currently. I'm actually currently out of bronze. Oh, no. oh you just got kicked out of bronze. Oh. Yeah. Dude, this is the, the human uh, reward. Uh, this is what reinforces our behavior, right? It's the leaderboard. There it is, 42. 42, OK. Yeah. Let's check it out. Okay, so this is watch one of the games. This is um oh do you have a, a game you want us to watch? A favorite or uh, do we want to do a win uh, or a tie, a lose, anything? Does it matter? I suspect all of the games I'm tying is because the people who are tying with me are using my That's what I would guess <laughs> too. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you can you can just play them, it doesn't matter. Let's go. Because the thing with this RL agent, this tutorial one, it doesn't cover everything. For example, it doesn't grow lichen itself. I removed that from the action space just to make it easier. Right, to yep. But a really easy way to improve your agent is to just make it grow like in the end of the game. <laughs> um, because you actually <laughs> oh, have so yeah. much water by end. Yeah. Um, and so another recommendation, you should open in a full visualizer because the full visualizer has graphs, which kind of tell you a story of the how top the game is. Ooh. Yeah. This is so cool. 
<clears throat> so I, I had yeah. never opened this up before. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, yeah, so we can see how uh, power and practice increases over time. And so for me, my all agent is the red one. Yep. You can see that it's very, very good at doing two things. So let me just play it a little bit. If you look at the factory power, factory one's power, you'll see that it starts at 1,000, but constantly goes down to zero. And this is an interesting strategy that's not in the rule-based kits. Um, it's actually completely learned by the agent. The agent learns to pick up power from the factory so it can power his big. Mm. And it also learns to optimally not to pick up power every single time, and instead only picks it up when it needs it. So you see how the factory power keeps going up? It only goes down every once in a while. Yeah. Um, and so this agent actually learned to optimally choose when to pick a power based on how much power it has now, and also optimally kind of deliver ice back at periodic time intervals. So you can see how periodic it is <laughs> with some of the graphs in red. Right, right. Um, it learns to repeatedly do the same thing, and you will see that water just constantly goes up. You can see the pickup, so, yeah. too, with, like when it's picking up power. Yeah. With the power and robust one, and then the water in factories, the ice in factories. Very cool. This is awesome. Yeah. So I was watching, um, so chess.com recently did like a computer chess tournament <laughs> with some of their bots. I don't know if you've played with any of their bots, but this has given me an idea that Bovard, when you and I are not streaming, we should just like let this stream live on our Twitch, like just let these, these games play <laughs> so people can watch, yeah. <laughs> people can watch computer Kaggle. Uh, like I was watching computer chess <laughs> tournaments the other day. So, um, because we do have to go soon, I believe we've got maybe like five minutes yep. to wrap up. Um, but uh, this is super cool. Yep. Um, um, so a couple last comments about the RL stuff. So you notice that in the R one, we use like a dense reward. The reason why people want to use sparse rewards is because the sparse reward doesn't define what you think is good. Because that's a human definition of what you think is good. But for example, we saw one agent that doesn't mine ice at all. That could be the optimal strategy. I have no idea. But supposedly with sparse rewards, if you win more games, you have more reward, right? And that's our ultimate objective. And so somehow the sparse reward is more connected to the ultimate objective. And as a result, you'll learn the correct behaviors or optimal. Um, so yeah, there's some other food for thought for that design. Very nice. <clears throat> Cool. Um, so yeah, with our last few minutes, like how sh how should we wrap up? Like, what are the best things to leave for folks who might be interested in checking out either of these notebooks or joining the competition? Like, what's maybe they've got th there's three months to go, so there's plenty of time. <laughs> there's plenty of time to join um, and uh, compete for the fifty five thousand dollar prize money that's on the line, or just to have fun and learn. Yeah, so I think a couple things. Um, so this launch, we have a pretty active Discord around Lux. Oh, great. Um, so if you look at uh, the description and introduction in the last sentence there, make sure to join our community Discord chat. Uh, people are really helpful and friendly there. Stone somehow is like hardwired Discord to his brain, so he responds in about <laughs> 30 seconds to most things in there. Sorry, Stone. But uh, so uh, really helpful, whether you're doing a rules-based solution, or an RL solution, you can get a lot of help in there. Um, then we've got, yeah, join the competition. Uh, those two notebooks are both public. I've created a new discussion topic. So if you go to discussions, uh, and I pinned that we went on Twitch and covered the two notebooks. Oh, here I'll we are. The, Very cool. The VOD uh, link on there. And then this will be cut uh, for YouTube, and it'll go up on YouTube. Uh, awesome. It looks like we have one question here. A couple questions. Um, couple questions. Any particular motivation behind the action cues to control the bots? At the moment, it seems like people just send it one command at a time. Um, I, I think most people who are their tutorial agents will do that because it's quite easy to do and it's very similar to last season. But some of the more advanced team, you'll see actually plan actions like 20 steps in ahead. Um, and so the reason why it's just, it's just a new mechanic that's kind of interesting um, that we've never really seen with kind of like simulations or RL actually in general. In fact, a lot of people who are working on RL right now, some of you I know, they actually have to think quite a bit to figure out how to model the action queue space because the action queue space plus our current action space makes Lux have 10 to the power of 3,000 different actions every turn. <laughs> that is about, and if you want a comparison, StarCraft is 10 to 100. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very complex when you have action queues. Um, 
So, yeah, it, it just makes the environment much more interesting to play with. And I think for rule-based teams, it's much more interesting for them because now they have an upper hand. Uh, I think typically with these kind of planning algorithms, you can use like a heuristic algorithm to kind of fail these plans, whereas for RL, it's a whole different problem to solve. Right. Yeah, and <clears throat> we were kind of thinking about the design for season two. You know, season one, RL just absolutely dominated everybody else, followed by IL, uh, imitation learning, which is the second question here. Do we expect imitation learning to have a big part here? And if you are giving a penalty for giving it every single action, that is a direct nerf to both reinforcement learning and imitation learning bots. Um, because if you're giving it a command every turn, you're paying that extra action cost, which means if someone doesn't have to pay the action cost, they're going to get a pretty sizable advantage over time. So I think imitation bots, to go to the second question here, will not do as well as they would have last year because of this planning aspect. Uh, and to go a little bit further into the planning aspect, it's kind of like a programming language in itself in that you can repeat actions. And so you can build up this whole action queue of like, go four squares west, mine six times to your full, go four squares east, drop off your thing, pick up your power, and then repeat the queue. Um, so all those actions will be repeated. So you give it the, the thing once, and then your bot just goes off and does the mining for the entire rest of the game. So it's very, you only have to pay that penalty of giving the actions once the entire game, as long as no enemies get in your way and you figured out all your pattern and stuff. So there could be some really optimal, like there's two robots here and they're both crossing over and you've timed it exactly perfectly with all your repeat actions. Um, so it's a very, very deep and interesting, interesting problem. Very cool. Well, we'll have to do a third check-in with you, Stone, when the competition is coming to a close to see what sure. uh, strategies and uh, different things ended up emerging from uh, the competition over the future three months uh, that it's taking place. So, um, but yeah, I think we do have to wrap up here for today. Um, but thank you so much, Stone, for coming on and for creating all of these great resources for helping folks to get started and um, yeah, appreciate the time and the, the walkthroughs and the conversation. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks, Oscar.